Thank you for having me here today. My name is Tiffany Powell Wiley, and I am an assistant clinical investigator at NHLBI. Um, our focus in my lab is on the social determinants of health and as they relate to obesity and cardiovascular risk. And today I'll be focusing on health disparities and community-based participatory research, or CBPR. So I'll give an introduction to CBPR over the, um, the lecture today and really talk about its role in the reduction of health disparities. I'll use some work that we're doing in my research group as a case study and focus specifically on a clinical protocol that we're doing called the Washington DC Cardiovascular Health and Needs Assessment. So before I go into CBPR, I wanna put this in the context of other types of community engagement work and this really is one form of community engagement, which also includes practice-based research networks, uh, community-oriented primary care, and CBPR. So in thinking about the definition of CBPR, it really is an approach to research. It's not a specific method, but an approach. And it involves working amongst community members, organizations, and academic researchers, really uh, working equitably among those groups on all aspects of the research process. It also enables each partner to contribute to the research process and the development and implementation of research projects and is meant to en enhance understanding across these groups and, to, and meant to integrate knowledge gained from both interventions and policy changes for community-based uh, individuals. And when we think about community, we can really define community in many different ways. It can be based on geography, as you'll see based uh, when I talk about the work that we do here in DC, but it can also be based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or a specific health condition. And the groups that are involved in CBPR can be those who have a common interest, such as healthcare organizations or agencies, healthcare providers, as well as community-based groups with common public health concerns. In addition, policymakers are involved quite a bit in community-based participatory research, both at the uh, state, local, and even at the uh, tribal level, um, in, particularly in Native American populations. So how did uh, CBPR develop, and what was the rationale for this type of work? It really uh, developed uh, based on the demands for uh, research and interventions that are uh, from the community up as opposed, uh, as opposed to more of a top-down approach. And it's really based on the understanding of the importance of context, uh, particularly local context and uh, the context of the culture within a community. It also comes from the need for understanding that health and social problems within a specific community are complex and don't necessarily fit with what an expert from the outside may view it as. In addition, we know that, um, and I'm sure you've learned about this um, as a part of this course, we know the history of research abuse and mistrust, particularly um, amongst underserved and at-risk communities. And this is a way to really bring them into the conversation and into the development of research that affects their community. In addition, we know that particularly in addressing health, in health disparities, the results of interventions haven't really been sustainable. And these CBPR is thought to be a way that we can help in improving the results for, in, for interventions and really develop uh, interventions that utilize best practices and processes within a specific community. In reducing health disparities in particular, uh, CBPR can be used in approaching research for those communities that have been most affected by health disparities and really again involves developing partnerships among trusted community members in these at-risk communities and, I, and regardless of the socioeconomic level or resources within a community it's really about identifying assets within a specific uh, population or community to and help improve outcomes and reduce disparities. The goal is really to tailor the outcomes for a specific intervention to the needs of that community. So just to give a little background about myself as a researcher, I come to the uh, research uh, 
field as a cardiologist and really interested in prevention um, as a cardiologist. And one area that I focused on has been particularly in obesity given some of the data that we know about the relationship between obesity and cardiovascular outcomes. For instance, this is just one study that we did looking at um, a, a sample called the National Cardiovascular Disease Registry, or the Get With the Guidelines Registry, which looks at data from hospitals all over the country. And we saw that obesity, particularly uh, what we call class three obesity, or those with a body mass index at or above 40, were at a significantly higher risk of 30-day mortality or, or death after an ST elevation myocardial infarction in this population. And what we found when we looked at the data more closely was that those who were in um, at highest risk were those who were a younger population who had less extensive coronary artery disease, but they had more risk factors. And this population was disproportionately African-American women those who had the class three obesity were disproportionately African-American women. And so it really suggested a need for targeting um, African-American women in particular as an at-risk uh, population. But the question comes, how do you take what we know about um, risk, uh, cardiovascular risk in this population, and translate it into interventions that may work? And so when we think of obesity as a, as a risk factor for heart disease, you can really think of it as one of several cardiovascular health factors. And we know that physical activity and diet in particular not only influence body mass index as a measure of obesity, but it also influences other uh, measures of cardiovascular health, such as cholesterol, glucose, and blood pressure. And so what we want to think about is how can we target cardiovascular health, uh, particularly the behaviors that relate to cardiovascular health in at-risk populations. These health factors can be thought of as ideal, intermediate, or poor, depending on the level of control. And we know that those um, in the United States, from some of the work that we've done, we've seen that those in the United States with poor cardiovascular health are really less likely to have health care access. And so if we're going to target a population with poor cardiovascular health by improving health behaviors, we, we really need to think about targeting them outside of the clinical setting where um, they may be more likely to be uh, a, a re ready and um, able to be a part of a particular intervention to improve cardiovascular health. And so as a researcher here at, at NIH, our group has really uh, focused on areas at risk in Washington, D.C. And so we've looked at um, areas that have, ha that have the highest obesity rates in Washington, D.C. And of the wards in Washington, D.C., those um, wards uh, five, seven, and eight are those that have the highest rates of obesity in the city. But also these are areas where median household income is lowest uh, for the population as compared to the city as a whole. And so this, as has been, um, this has helped us to really think about where we want to work in developing community-based interventions in the Washington, D.C. area, targeting at-risk populations, um, particularly in the African-American community. And so our goal was to really think about how do we uh, use a community-based participatory research approach in working in these at-risk communities. So in thinking about engaging a community with CBPR, we need to really consider the principles of uh, CBPR. And these are principles that not only um, apply when you're thinking about starting an, a project, a, a research program around CBPR, but it really, they, uh, they relate to uh, your work throughout the process. And so the first and probably one of the most important ones is really to be clear and about the purpose and goals of this, the effort. And really it means being clear and honest from the beginning about what is possible for the work that you're doing in collaboration with community uh, members, but also what is not possible. 
It's also important to become knowledgeable about that community. So with us working in Washington, D.C., it required us to really know what's going on in the community around health, but also just in general um, around uh, changes um, at the governmental level, but um, just, just in thinking about what is the culture of Washington, D.C. in general. It also requires, in engaging the community, requires going into the community from the beginning and really building trust. And that means not only um, being working with those who may not, who may be open to what you're doing, but also getting opinions from those who may not necessarily be open to the work you're doing and, and, and trying to figure out what may be some of the barriers in building that trust. But hopefully, the, as um, you engage in, with the community, you can obtain and, and develop commitment from both the formal and informal leaders within the community. It's also important to accept that, the, the, that self-determination and, and the um, ability of communities to determine what they want to do on their own is really their right, and it really is um, it's the right of anyone who's a part of that community. And the, again, this CBPR is meant to be a partnership, and so it's meant to not only work at improving the health of the community, but in in some ways, it can be a way of creating change around policy measures for that community. And again, it's important to recognize and respect the diversity of community opinions and those within the community who may, be, who may want to be a part of what you're doing, but who may have strong opinions against what you're doing. Um, as far as other uh, important principles, it's important to identify and mobilize assets within the community. And really with, within any community, there are things that work and help and, and keep people together uh, for those members. It's also important to think about as you develop your uh, program, how do you, um, how do you maintain flexibility in the program to meet the changing needs of the community, and also how does your intervention, uh, how, what is controlled by the community in, um, in what you're, in the type of uh, programs you're putting forward. And finally, this is a long-term process, and so it's not something that can happen overnight as far as building the relationships that are required, but also um, it takes time to build the types of um, projects and interventions that may help in improving communities' health. So I think of the guiding principles and values that CBPR um, involves, I think one of the most important to remember and to think about is building trust. Because I think without trust, um, you won't really be able to build any type of uh, program or any type of work that is collaborative in nature, but also that is uh, that moves forward. And so from the, the trust that you're able to build with community members and leaders, you gain uh, respect for each other, you um, determine the mutuality of interest, you are able to see and, under, and, and recognize self-determination and take a and understand things from each other's perspective. And also you're able to make sure that you understand the benefit on both sides of the uh, program, that it's not one side benefiting versus another, um, and that it really is uh, mutually beneficial uh, for the community. So as I stated earlier, CBPR is really designed as an approach to research. It's not one specific method or a set of methods. And it can involve both qualitative as well as quantitative methods. So it can involve anything from epidemiologic data 
to focus group data to um, data gathered through a clinical trial or a, a randomized study. And really the goal is to influence improvement in, or change in community health, but also look at how what is your, what happens with you, the uh, program can influence the norms, the systems, uh, uh, programs, and policies within a specific community. And so it really involves not just thinking about a specific uh, study or intervention, but thinking about how can these, this work influence policies at the community level. And CBPR is particularly applicable to four types of research. The first being descriptive research to identify determinants of health, particularly social determinants of health within a particular uh, community. Um, studies that look at the health status of a community and, or particularly how disparities uh, relate to the health status and to uh, uh, risk within a particular community. The third type of research um, that CBPR is particularly applicable to is research to understand the needs of the community as well as their resources, uh, problems, and assets. And finally, um, it's applicable to efforts to, for uh, designing interventions that target uh, uh, health issues within the uh, population. And so I'll be talking mainly about work that we've done around the uh, last two types of, um, or last two applications for CBPR, particularly research to assess the needs and, and uh, issues within a community and uh, research to develop interventions for the community uh, in Washington, D.C. So when we think about um, the phases of a CBPR project, it really is an iterative process, but it can it really um, hinges upon, again, maintaining, but and I would say actually creating, um, maintaining, and working to sustain the partnership with com uh, community members as a part of the work. But in forming um, the partnership, that means, uh, and I'll go through each, uh, each of these steps as, we, as I go through um, uh, uh, describing what we've done in Washington, D.C., but um, it starts really with forming the partnership, again, based on trust amongst uh, community members and uh, trust with uh, the researchers and those um, from academia. The first step as you're uh, forming the partnership is really in assessing the strengths of the community and the assets within the community identifying and working together to identify priority issues and research questions. The next step is in designing the intervention or, um, or uh, policy research. And then t a big part of CBPR is really about dissemination and working with the community to interpret the research findings and disseminating those findings back to community members. And this process can identify additional steps uh, for the research program and can really, as, as I said, uh, be an iterative process where as you disseminate um, from a particular st uh, study or program, you determine ways in which you can develop newer programs or newer interventions to help uh, address specific issues for the community. So the first step is really in the building partnerships. And it's, I think the most important thing to recognize is that in building those partnerships, it's important to be honest about the intentions, uh, capacities, and liabilities as a research, um, as, a, as a researcher. And I think that works both ways. Um, and things working much more effectively when community members also are honest about um, their intentions and, and, and capacities as well. 
It's also important as a research institution to be open and honest about the strengths and liabilities um, as, as, um, as you approach individuals about building partnerships within the community. With this process, um, it involves uh, identifying partners with whom to work, but also negotiating the terms by which you will work together and creating <clears throat> a structure by which you can work <clears throat> as, excuse me, <clears throat> by which you can work from as academicians and community members and thinking about how you will work towards decision making and what the overarching principles of your work will entail. And it also can involve really getting into details about control of budgets, control of data, and how um, that can, who will be involved in that process from the academic standpoint and the community standpoint. So for our research group, again, we're, our focus has really been on thinking about how do you develop interventions that target and improve cardiovascular health. And so in approaching uh, research um, or, or approaching community members in Washington, D.C. to work with us from the beginning, it really was about being honest about what we could offer as a research group. We knew that while there may be interest in other types of um, uh, other areas of um, health that the community wanted to focus on, we really had to identify those in the community who wanted to work with us in um, focusing on cardiovascular health. And so that really meant identifying community members, uh, leaders, people in those in government who really had um, a vested interest in thinking about cardiovascular health. But that's not to say that in building those uh, partnerships, we didn't meet with individuals who um, weren't necessarily interested in what we were doing, and that, and that helped us to see kind of what other things may be going on in the community, but also helped us to think about how could we connect those who were interested in other health topics with uh, researchers at NIH or um, in our other academic institutions with whom we were collaborating. We also had to recognize that um, as a, a researcher coming from a government institution, we were in many ways different from those coming from academia. And there was a level of, of distrust that we had to overcome just being from a government entity. And so we really, again, had to be honest and open about what was required for us as a, a, government, <clears throat> a, a government research team. But also we had to recognize the mistrust that existed in the community due to uh, past um, research abuse. But being from NIH in particular and being from the um, intramural program, we um, had to um, be clear that our strengths were really in thinking about novel ways of intervening in the community. Um, for instance, our focus has been on thinking about how to use mobile health technology in uh, intervening in cardiovascular health. And so we had to be honest again about wh what we could bring to the table in that regard. And so this um, identifying potential partners really was a um, long process in many ways, but um, it was a way of identifying um, folks through one-on-one -on -one meetings with community members, with community leaders, but also involved presenting what we were uh, proposing and what we were, the type of partnership we were interested in, um, presenting that to government um, through meetings with city council members, meetings at the uh, community level, at uh, advisory neighborhood commission meetings, working with academic organizations within uh, the, in Washington, D.C., but also um, focusing on um, 
other community partnership, potential community partnerships, particularly with churches within Washington, D.C., because we felt that um, we could, if we were able to build trust with leaders, particularly within the church community, we could, um, that would help in building trust with other community members. And so this work in really building partnerships took uh, about a year and a half before we were able to say, here are the pieces of, or here are the folks that we're going to be able to work together with and focus on cardiovascular health. And so from our partnership building, we were able to develop a community advisory board, which we um, termed the DC Cardiovascular Health and Obesity Collaborative. And this involved members from faith-based organizations, as well as nonprofit organizations and uh, leaders from the local and federal government in Washington, D.C., academic and healthcare organizations, as well as representatives from each of the wards that we were uh, focused on developing interventions in. And so after the year and a half or so of working to develop partnerships, we began to start having quarterly meetings with our advisory board to talk about how we could, what type of work or what type of project and initial project could we work at developing and how could that be implemented within the, our, the target community in Washington, D.C. So with the next step of the CBPR process, it's really about identifying the research questions and the methods. And this really differentiates community outreach from CBPR. And these are questions that can develop jointly from the, both um, academia and um, the community, and they can come together in, in, um, de in deciding which questions to focus on, or they can come from a community advisory board as, as we developed and really um, uh, be developed as a in partnership between the, the um, academics and community members. And it varies as far as how involved the advisory um, committee is in developing these research questions, but I think in building that trust that is required in CBPR, it's fundamental that there is a committee that really vets the questions that um, are developed um, by the community and by uh, the research, um, the researchers in academia. And the other question is whether um, the continual participation of the advisory committee informs or changes the intervention. And I think that's where the flexibility has to come in, in really being able to change or adjust the areas of focus for a research project depending on what is recommended by the community. The, the third step in CBPR is the data collection process. And this process is um, a way in which community um, members can be involved in both data collection as well as um, interpretation of the data. And in thinking about data collection, community members can be trained on interviewing other uh, community members as well as um, working to collect uh, survey data or can be trained to uh, serve as facilitators of focus groups. One thing to think about um, is that these are opportunities for community members to be involved in um, the data collection process and may, this may also improve response rates um, in, in working with community members, but we can, it's, you cannot um, ignore um, potential confidentiality issues, if, uh, particularly if you're dealing with sensitive topics, um, in, if community members are 
um, collecting data from those that they already know um, in the community if it's a small uh, population you're working with. And so from our uh, working with the Community Advisory Board and working with other academic partners, we developed a hypothesis that we could use this uh, CBPR approach, um, including both qualitative and uh, quantitative approaches to engage community members in our um, target areas in Washington, D.C. to use mobile health technology in targeting physical activity and dietary intake as cardiovascular health factors. And so based on input from the advisory board and um, in collaboration with uh, a research group at Howard University, we developed our first protocol, which was a, what we titled the cardiovascular health and needs assessment. And this was what we defined as a first step in d developing a behavioral intervention targeting uh, weight loss in the, in our air, in the at-risk areas of Washington, D.C. And this was designed as an observational study to look at uh, two, one primary uh, goal or one primary endpoint, and that was really to look at the prevalence of ideal, intermediate, and poor levels of cardiovascular health factors in an, a sample population from predominantly African-American uh, faith-based organizations in the target wards in Washington, D.C. And our secondary uh, goals for the protocol were to uh, look at how, look at the type of tools that uh, community members could use, um, uh, particularly around uh, mobile health technology in targeting physical activity and diet. And so we looked at um, a physical activity wristband uh, for measuring physical activity in the population. We looked at the feasibility of using digital cameras for measuring dietary intake. We looked at web-based tools for monitoring cardiovascular health. And we also wanted to get a sense of barriers to behavior change for the population and so we looked at um, psychosocial factors, cultural factors, as well as environment factors, neighborhood factors that may uh, serve as barriers to physical activity and diet for the population. And so based on um, this approach, our community advisor board recommended um, several ways in which we should go to the community before we implemented the larger health and needs assessment and really get input on the tools that we were trying to use as a part of the health and needs assessment. And so they, um, our advisory board recommended first that we look at the survey instrument um, that we were interested, that we wanted to use for the health and needs assessment to see what community members thought about it, were there other questions that they wanted to add to it, was it too long? Did it, were, was it something that community, community members would not be interested in, in being a part of? And the second uh, focus group that we, uh, they recommended was to look at potential barriers to using the technology uh, for the population. And so all, both of these focus groups were done in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Gwen Wallen's group here at NIH but they were really designed to test out the tools we were using before um, and to really get input on how to um, better tailor these tools uh, for the health and needs assessment and for the needs of the community. And so based on our initial uh, focus group, looking at the um, survey instrument in particular, we uh, made several changes to the survey. And that meant, um, or the recommendations were, for instance, we reformatted several of the questions so that they, uh, the, the um, scales made more sense for the community. And we also included uh, several types of uh, questions that um, members thought were more specific to what uh, individuals might see as barriers to physical activity and diet, particularly around uh, self-efficacy. There are also specific questions on health behaviors that they thought needed to be um, added to the survey. And so we used a um, 
cognitive interview, a group-based cognitive interview for doing this focus group so that we could really delve into each of the questions from the survey in a group setting to maximize the type of information that we could gain as a part of the focus group. In testing the physical activity uh, um, system and, and testing that in the population as a part of the uh, focus group, we were able to see um, the levels of physical activity just for those participants within the um, pilot testing or, or within the focus group. And so individuals who are part of the focus group uh, used the physical activity monitor for two weeks, and we looked at their uh, levels over that two-week period. And what we saw was that there was wide variability, but really a large number of our participants had steps uh, per day of around 5,000, which would be considered sedentary. And so this was kind of our first, or first indication that um, physical activity levels appeared to be suboptimal for um, our, the population we were working with. But in addition to the physical activity data that we um, saw as a part of the focus group, we were able to see that, or we were able to get quite a bit of insight into how we um, tr trained individuals to use the physical activity monitors as a part of the, uh, from the focus group. We also were able to test out the, um, the website to get a sense of how people, uh, what people thought about the website. And, and from the focus group, there were several suggestions, uh, one of which was to build in somebody who was an expert at each church with which we were working who could help individuals uh, use their physical activity device if they had any problems. So uh, we hypothesized that, um, we, that people would use the physical activity wristbands as a part of the larger health and needs assessment. But again, we, we wanted to make sure there was a system that was, um, could overcome potential barriers uh, for um, self-monitoring in the community and really could be used regardless of whether somebody had a smartphone or mobile device or whether they had a computer at home. And so in the larger health and needs assessment, uh, participants received a physical activity wristband, which they wore for at least a 30-day period. And they um, were able to upload their uh, physical activity data to what we called a hub at each of the participating churches. And then from the hub, data was wirelessly uploaded through a secure server um, to a computer or to uh, where um, or was uploaded to a server, excuse me, and it could be viewed on a computer either at the church or at home for participants, but we could uh, view the results as a research team. And so this system really allowed us to overcome several potential barriers, particularly any um, socioeconomic or geographic barriers to broadband or Wi-Fi access limited potential limited access to computers for the population as well as um, any uh, restrictions on smartphone data plans for use of mobile health devices and finally any limitations as far as technology limit literacy in the population and so the goal is really to have a system that anyone in the community could use regardless of whether they had used uh, this type of mobile technology before so as part of the larger um, health and needs assessment, um, we developed a way of doing data collection at each of the uh, churches with which we were working. And it really involved uh, stations um, for data collection. And throughout this process, we involved um, volunteers from the community to help in some of the, um, in maintaining some of the logistics for the data collection, of course being cognizant that um, we had to maintain confidentiality for participants' uh, data as a part of the study. So for each of our data collection events, participants moved through stations where they um, underwent uh, testing for cardiovascular health measures such as glucose, blood pressure, 
and uh, body weight. They underwent the survey instrument for assessing the psychosocial, behavioral, and environmental factors. They underwent a, a training to use the devices for me measuring physical activity. And then everyone um, I reviewed everyone's results with them that day, particularly the blood, blood testing and uh, blood pressure and body measurements from, the, from that day. And so we had about 25 participants that went through each of the data collection events. And we had uh, six data collection events over four church sites for the health and needs assessment. And in each site, uh, we had, again, based on feedback from the focus group, we had an expert in, based, who lived in the community and went to that church who helped individuals use the physical activity system, uh, data collection system over the 30-day uh, follow-up period. So at this point, you, as, as far as thinking about the next step of CBPR, it's important it, we're at the step of data analysis. And this is where, uh, in many ways, um, as from as an academic researcher, um, we have the expertise as far as um, doing statistical programming and um, and doing analyses for both the quantitative and qualitative data. But it's very important that you think about how can you help or work with um, community members in. Um, doing some of these analyses, but also how do you think, how do you present this data so that you can gain interpretations from community members on the study findings? And really, the community is, their expertise really is in putting the interpretation of the importance of the findings in the context of the, uh, the community's needs and really in thinking about based on what uh, is found in the study, what could be the potential next steps uh, uh, from the, as, as far as based on the needs of the community. Another important role for the community is really in protecting the, the, the community in, in each step of the research process. So from our um, health and needs assessment, we were able to recruit 100 participants, the majority of whom were African-American women. And so our participants, about half of our participants came from our target wards of Washington, DC. The other half came from areas adjacent to these wards in Prince George's County. And so we were able to um, recruit a population the majority of which lived in a um, contiguous geographic area in uh, the Washing ar around Washington, D.C. and Prince George's County. And we also saw that those that um, were from Prince George's County, again, were from areas that had lower um, socioeconomic level. And so it really suggested to us that, again, we were able to recruit a, a potentially at-risk population based on the resource limitations of their environments. We were also able to see that monitoring physical activity using the system uh, that incorporated the hubs was, uh, was feasible for our population. And so when we looked at um, the, those who used the hub over each of the events at the, um, during the health and needs assessment, we saw that at each of the data collection events, over uh, at least over 60% um, of participants synced with the hub at least once over the 30-day period. And uh, over 40% um, from each of the events provided 30 days, complete 30 days of physical activity data. And so overall, about 81% of the study population provided physical activity data for the 30-day um, period. We also found that those who actually used the physical activity monitor and used the data collection system 
there was little difference as far as age um, and sex of the of the populations, but those who use the system had a l lower household income, or the majority had a lower household income as compared to those who didn't use the system. And again, this suggested to us that we were work that we were able to recruit an at-risk population as a part of the health and needs assessment. And when we looked at uh, potential targets for intervention from the health and needs assessment, we saw that the majority of those who participated, particularly among women, uh, had obesity um, with a large number with class three obese, obesity in the population. And when we looked at physical activity across these uh, populations, per, uh, across weight categories in the health and needs assessment, we saw that for women in particular, uh, physical activity levels decreased over the across the weight categories, suggesting that if, in working with uh, or in developing targets for intervention, we could really focus on physical activity levels for overweight and obese women uh, in the in these areas of Washington D.C. And so, the next step in thinking about what to or how to move forward in the CBPR process is really in disseminating the findings to community members. And again, it means uh, being accountable to communities and protecting um, the information uh, for the communities and making sure that you maintain confidentiality of any data. And so this really is an important, but unfortunately at times it, it is um, an overlooked process or a, uh, it comes quite late in the process of CBPR. And so the work around dissemination can involve presentations, but it can also involve uh, written reports. And I think it really is important to look at all potential avenues for how the data collected and the information uh, gleaned from a CBPR project can be provided to the community. And in fact, I think it's also important to think about um, looking for opportunities to, to uh, participate in dissemination because in many ways, a lot of the organizations who are a part of who are in communities are very taxed, very busy, and so it's really important to think about how do you get that information to them in the easiest way possible. The other important thing is uh, as we, that we cannot overlook as academics is really thinking about uh, publication, and I think one thing to keep in mind is that community members also need to be a part of the publication process. And so from our work, we tried to start early in the dissemination process by uh, looking at dissemination of the focus group data, even before we had the uh, health and needs assessment data. And as a part of the dissemination process, we evaluated how um, the community, how the community was organized for dissemination and what their preferred methods of dissemination might be. And from that, that um, assessment, we saw that um, the preferred method would be uh, briefs and newsletters, and so we've worked at developing those to give to our partnering churches and community advisory boards. But we're in the process of really thinking about what other types of methods can we use in disseminating the findings um, from our study in the best and most expeditious uh, way possible. We've also done several presentations in the community, and um, from an academic standpoint, we've been involved in uh, writing abstracts and publications, and while we haven't had community members who've wanted to take the lead in some of these um, publications, they have been a part of the process. So I can't um, <laughs> say that there are no challenges, of course, with um, uh, CBPR. And in thinking about these challenges, um, I think a lot of it uh, boils down to 
how the partnership is is developed and how the um, what the power structure is. And it there can be challenges around who uh, who sets the research question or um, maintaining or trying to maintain some equi equ equity as far as um, knowledge. Um, and we also need to be very cognizant in everything we do in any potential um, historical abuse ar around research and um, uh, the influence of stereotyping or racism and how that can, again, um, hinder the trust within the partnership and relationship. And it's very important to really face the reality of that history and be willing to discuss it if needed and acknowledge that there may be uh, individuals or, or organizations who may, that may be a, a, um, a barrier that cannot be overcome in working uh, with an academic institution. Another issue, of course, is, is thinking about the timeline as a as an academic, it's um, there's definitely a difference in timeline as far as um, this type of clinical research as opposed to um, those um, that may occur at the bench or even at the bedside as far as uh, publishing and and there really is a different timeline as far as um, what the community sees as as important as opposed to what may be important for uh, academic promotion. And again, it's, this is an iterative process, and so the goals can change over time as far as, um, uh, as far as what the focus of the research may be. And it's important to listen to the community and really work together in uh, making decisions about uh, next steps. But with all of the challenges, there are um, immense benefits to being a part of uh, CBPR. And really, um, I think th the relevance of the research questions that develop really are enhanced with the influence and input from the community. And the, the reliability and val validity of some of these instruments and measures that are used in the community are also enhanced by tailoring those tools uh, for uh, the needs of the community. By incorporating and working with community members, um, not only can you uh, enhance recruitment and retention, but I think you really, more importantly, um, I think you're able to develop an intervention or a program that incorporates the needs of the community, the cultural culture of the community into um, potentially into scientifically valid and um, potentially uh, um, important approaches to changing uh, health within a um, at-risk population. I think um, there's also an important um, benefit of um, more effective dissemination of uh, findings from um, CBPR projects that can um, impact policy, and also um, a potentially faster translation of evidence-based uh, research to uh, community, to sustainable interventions within communities. And this is a, I think it's important to recognize and to be cognizant from the beginning of what are the specific benefits to the community and what are you working towards to help the community and what types of resources are, are being provided for the community that, that are sustainable over a long period of time. And at its, um, at its best, CBPR joins partners with diverse experience and, and expertise in really uh, developing tailored interventions. So as far as our work um, in D.C., our, we've really been thinking more recently about how do we uh, work at improving our community advisory board, in particular, how do we work at increasing community members' um, involvement in the advisory board, especially those who live in our target wards. And that 
has also led to us thinking about different methods for disseminating our findings. But our hope is that, um, and our current work is also um, in developing an intervention targeting physical activity um, and focusing not only on these areas of DC, but also areas of Prince George's County that are at risk, at risk as well. And so our hope is that we can develop an intervention that uses um, novel tools, but also is tailored to the needs of, of these neighborhoods. So I'd like to end by acknowledging uh, uh, particularly Dr. Francisco Sai from NIMHD and others who've uh, provided some uh, input into these slides. I'd also I want to acknowledge uh, our study participants from our work um, here and because without them, none of, none of this um, experience would be possible. And I'd also like to acknowledge the collaborators um, on our uh, work in Washington, D.C., particularly the, um, our D.C. CHOC, our Community Advisory Board. So with that, I'm happy to take questions, and um, thank you very much for your time.